All right, thanks. Thanks. Uh, what an amazing turnout, and, and thanks for joining me for um, showing you some of the research I've been doing. My name is John Spencer. I'm the chair of Urban Warfare Studies for the Modern War Institute, which is a research center that we stood up at West Point to study modern war because we found that historians, of course, study the past, and really news reporting covers the current, but that wasn't being fed into military's professional education as much as the current fights, the fights that are happening right now. Um, although we all talk about lessons learned and all of that, it wasn't being fed. Um, so I started studying urban warfare in 2014 for the chief of staff of the U.S. Army specifically. And so I call myself a one-trick pony. While I taught strategy, I can talk about warfare, I can talk about the phases of Ukraine war right now, I study urban warfare, warfare for cities, in cities, um, by defined as urban, as in buildings, people, and infrastructure together. So this is a briefing that I put together on the Battle of Kiev because I do think, and, and I, I could argue it and debate it, it's the most, the most decisive battle in the modern era, as in a battle that determines the strategic objectives for both sides. This battle, the Battle of Kiev. Uh, I, I came here in July of last year to walk the ground, that's, I have a dream job, I get to walk the ground around the world to battles because I think you can, you really miss out if you don't actually walk the ground, talk to people that fought there, uh, see the terrain and, and the topography and, and all the different variables. But as I, I talked to my friend Sam, storytelling is really hard. And how do you, um, we write case studies for the Modern Wars too. So I, I wrote a 5,000 word case study on the Battle of Stalingrad which is you know, a million man army, a million man uh, enemy. How do you summarize a battle that big? You have to, that's storytelling, it's human nature. So as you see, this is the briefing that I've been traveling around the world actually, because my job is to train cadets, militaries, and anybody who wants on urban, the, the unique features of fighting in urban areas and the importance that they will have on the future of combat. And I, one is job security for me. I do think that um, there is open terrain warfare, but the, the decisive battles that determine the goals will be continue to be fought for cities and in cities. So this, I just presented this, uh, but when I usually give up this procedure, I, I developed this slide because all urban warfare is not the same. As a matter of fact, it, there is a human aspect to when I tell you, when I say the words urban warfare, depending on what population I'm talking to, they immediately think about you know, entering and clearing a room, uh, you know, whatever iconic battle that comes to mind, like Stalingrad or Mogadishu, Black Hawk Down, things pop into their minds. I cover the full spectrum of, of battles and, and try to gather the similarities and repeating themes and the lessons relearned in major battles. But there's a giant difference from a, you know, a, a, a battle against peer enemies for a major objective and counterterrorism, counterinsurgency type of battles. The context, or as the historians like to say, the width, depth, and, and breadth of history matters. So you have to study each one in context. And why I keep coming back to Kiev is to try to further understand the context of the, the war, the chaos of war, the fog and the friction that was happening, but then be able to hopefully tell a story about what happened. So I always put this up as a disclaimer. And there's giant differences even in what we call a permissive urban battle and a non-permissive, as when you enter the environment, everything is a threat, versus when a military enters an urban environment and they know where their enemy is and they're moving towards it. There's a big difference in permissive and non-permissive environments. If you're a military and you enter the environment and everything, it, it could be a threat. So the Battle of Kiev, February 24th, 2022, um, you, you can't study a battle without understanding the city. Cities matter. Every city is different. The history of Kiev is ancient, of course. It predates Russia. It predates lots of things in this region. It was built on mountain bluffs. It has a giant river that, that actually is the reason that it's here, that prospered the civilization. Uh, it grew over time to where it actually overcome the peri-urban, which is where this battle happened in the peri-urban. It didn't happen downtown as much as um, people would want to think wasn't about high rises. Uh, it, it happened in the peri-urban as this city grew over time and, and took over 
more even agricultural villages that would feed the city center if, you, if you're a geek like me and you study cities. Uh, you know, it is the seat of political power. This is the, the military theory of this was the objective. Russia's objective was very clear, to overthrow the seat of political power for Ukraine, to er erase Ukraine as a nation and still a puppet Russian uh, satellite state on the borders of, of the main state. But that's, that's why cities are the future of warfare. They are the political seat of power. They are the economic engines of nations. They are sometimes the seat of military power. They are the objective. But you have to understand the, the sheer geography of Kiev, although we've seen lots of maps of it, to understand the geography of it, the density of how many residents live per square mile, all of that when I start to look at this, and, and Kiev was huge. Um, the idea that some people might have in their mind is that you need to encircle a city before you start to attack it. It's just not true in the history of warfare. But even if it was, if Russia would have sent everything it had, which was mistake, mistake number one, was you know, attack across seven different fronts, but for whatever reasons, even if they'd sent all of them towards Kiev, they wouldn't have been able to surround and isolate Kiev um, for that way. But there are many ways you can take down a city. So what I don't have on here, which I do have a map of, which is what I'm looking at this tour, is the underground. Yeah, attacking a city with a vast city under the city is a lot different than if it didn't have an underground. You, Kiev has some of the deepest metro tunnels in the world. It has a vast network of not just metro tunnels, but catacombs, water tunnels. Had this fight continued, that would come into play. And it actually came into play day one when you can stick your military headquarters underground, it makes it a lot harder to do what you have to do when you attack a city, which is take out command and control nodes, take out things that are important. Well, if you can't hit it with even a bunker busting bomb, it's gonna be really hard. So you have to understand the city before you even start talking about the plan of attack. So the plan of attack for Russia attacking in the Battle of Kiev. And again, I have to, when I give this presentation, I, I gotta go with generalities. Um, but there is popular media that believes what happened in the Battle of Kyiv. Maybe they'll focus on a very small aspect to it, but not understand the girth of the chaos that was February 24th. But it actually happened before February 24th. So these are my three courses of action that I believe that Russia had. It wasn't one plan. Russia had multiple plans to achieve their objective, which is take out the sitting government and steal their own make the population subservient, and do things they have done before in, in other countries and other locations. So number one, it was a, a, a very large intelligence operation, an infiltration, um, which included sleeper cells. It included uh, people that had been in fear for a long time that were both activated um, before February 24th and activated after February 24th. But what went against them, and there was a lot of weird stuff happening on February 24th. There's there's battles happening deep inside the city. There's the zoo. There, there, there's uh, Ukrainian soldiers. It, um, could be friendly fire, but it's just a lot of weird stuff going on. Um, a lot of that's classified what actually happened, but you can, you can guarantee the FSB and the other people that, that put all these things into place over a long time are upset that it didn't work. Uh, the Ukrainian police, SBU, and other people to, who had reorganized, reinvented themselves, were very effective at identifying saboteur groups um, with lists of people that they were going to take out, lists of, of, of buildings to attack, and, and had everything in a position. There's some aspects of just bad spy work, bad signals intelligence, and things like that that led to it. But you can pretty much say that course of action number one failed. But course of action number two, uh, which I'll talk about in detail, which is, you know, I come from, you know, I did 25 years in the military, but I was mostly light airborne ranger. The idea of the joint forcible entry is a very well-known, resourced, and fundamental action of a, a big power military. You, in, you do a very large campaign of shock and awe, of joint fires, deep fires, to take out everything that you know about. And then you try to do a, an airfield seizure. You try to do what's called a joint forcible entry, seize a airstrip, hold it, start air landing large aircraft, create a bridge, an air bridge, to flow your people into your objective. And in this aspect, much like in many other battles of the modern era, if you can do that, if you can seize an airfield, you can air land 
heavy equipment, the objective, and this is where you start seeing if, if, the, if the intelligence operation failed, the joint forcible entry objective wasn't about clearing the city. It wasn't about eliminating the enemy in the city. All the Russians had to do was get a sizable force to the Maidan, to the government building, and raise the Russian flag. That's it. Uh, pretty clear objectives. Many organizations be, can be given it. But that was course of action number two. I don't have a pointer. But course, in act, but course of action number two, heavily resourced, and I'll talk about it in detail if everybody's heard about Hostomel and, and the aspects of that. Course of action number two is the more, uh, which I've also been involved with, is the mounted penetration. Send multiple columns of heavy mechanized and armor and infantry forces towards the objective. Code number three. Yeah, sorry. In code number three, as you can, as we know, now know, most people in the room will probably know, and I'm sorry if it, this, I give this around the world, this is the first time I've had to get, I've given it in Ukraine, probably two people that were there. So, your generalities. Uh, Russia sent multiple columns from both Belarus and Russia itself headed towards their, their objectives. Um, yes, they thought that they could do it in three days, but not just down for, down, straight south from Chernobyl. We know that there are other avenues of approach and, and it had Chernib not held, the Battle of Kiev would look a lot different than it ended up having. Also forces not coming from Sumy but coming down from Russia along mounted avenues of approach headed towards the capital. And again, it wasn't about encircling the city and holding it. It was about penetrating anywhere they could uh, and, and getting to that government building and raising the Russian flag. This is for my, you know, this whole brief is usually for a military audience and like what lessons can other militaries take from what Ukraine was able to do. Uh, and by Ukraine, I mean Ukraine military civilians and their city did to defeat the second most powerful military in the world on paper. So, Hasamela Airfield, Antov Airport, February 24th, FSB operations going on until Operation was already being taken down, supercells, multiple raids, um, and I learned a lot about what that looked like. But the joint forcible entry was a go. It starts with long range fires, of course, hitting everything that was ever known. Here we get into the politics, right? So politics of war. Militaries don't get to do always what they want to do, and there's always political considerations in war. War is politics. Warfare is fighting. The, the 72nd Mechanized Brigade is the main brigade in charge of security of Kyiv. There are presidential level concerns about preparing for defending the city and, 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 and Ukraine as a whole. That drove to decisions on not being in certain positions on February 24th. That drove to the 72nd not being told, you were, no, you cannot go out there and be in position waiting for something to attack. That's political strength. That's, that's natural in war as well. So, but what that also leads to is that the Russians had spent a lot of time with sleeper cells, with, with uh, traders, all this, identifying everything they wanted to strike, right? There are, there's four, if not five airfields that could, could take uh, an airfield seizure in the invasion of Russia and large cargo planes. There's Hostomel, Borisfeld, Vasilky, and, and, and there's one other one. Uh, but they, they strike everything. Right, just it's almost a mini shock and all. There are things they didn't strike, which makes could be argued as what they thought they would need to leave into place and, and you know, preserve Kiev and preserve uh, everything they needed to. But they they struck a lot of things. Sometimes they struck stuff that looked like from aerial photos to be military targets, but weren't like museums or they struck things where stuff used to be. Which is here's the argument, which always can be done back when you look at history. 72nd Mechanized Brigade told they can't be out. They're not in positions that they would normally be in. Military leaders and, and other security forces make a decision to move stuff the day before the invasion or the day of the invasion, and then rockets rain down on where that stuff used to be, whether it's artillery pieces or other equipment, where they literally move or hide the limited resources they have in a city. If you really think about um, defending a city of three million people across that many square kilometers, one brigade, on paper, um, with other forces, of course, but the 72nd Mechanized Brigade, that's, you know, in my world, that's three to 4,000 soldiers. 
with a lot of assumptions on what's going on and where the Russians might be coming from. Uh, I, I tried to explain just what happened. So Hostomel Airfield is quickly determined, and I wanted to go into how it was determined as the, one of the primary objectives. And there's some stuff going on in Vassal Key that looks a little weird, uh, but Hostomel looks like it's going to be. So it gets struck. Um, and then, of course, the paratroopers conduct an air assault, 20 to 30 helicopters, I want to argue the numbers, of Russia's best forces, around 200, VDV are dropped into Hostomel. I was just last week with, with our own airborne forces, mine, that I jumped into combat with 20 years ago to the day, a couple days ago. And, and this is why this picture is interesting to me, because it's the VDV being dropped off at Hostomel with what they can carry on their back, right? Because that's kind of normal. You drop the paratroopers, they seize the airfield, they secure blocking positions. Which is interesting that, you know, of course, and this is war today, CNN's interviewing VDV commanders at their blocking positions that they're trying to establish within hours uh, of their arrival. But that is actually war. And, and, and I, I, last week, reminiscing, we jumped into northern Iraq in the middle of the night, and we woke up, there's CNN and Fox News. And I, it's funny that I'm at Keep Independent. It's just what happens. Uh, it's modern war. So, you know, of course... Classic airfield seizure, there, there's close air support, there's uh, lots of things exploding. And then the, everybody's heard about the KA-52 alligators, which is a close air support, supporting the air transport of those in. Um, the 4th Rapid Reaction Brigade actually takes one of those down, two more come down, but, and that's, that's amazing, uh, and, and they shot them down with a, a needle and not a stinger. As I was investigating as an American, like, where are the javelins? Where are the stingers that we all heard about? Like that, that, that's not a part of most of this picture. Um, it is definitely not the predominant part of the picture. But so the, the operation is a success, even though they lost three helicopters. The, the, the paratroopers land, they secure the airfield, and then the illusions are on their way. As a matter of fact, there is satellite imagery of the illusions waiting in, in places with the Russian forces that are going to take the city. And if you guys know better than I do, Hostomel is not that far from the objective, which is the city center. And if they could have gotten those cargo aircraft on the ground, but here's the other problem with a joint forcible entry, you have to achieve air supremacy. That is part of the main reason of SEAD or your fires plan is to take out all the air defenses. And man pads are a threat, but they're not, they're not impossible to deal with. But uh, that once the illusions get turned off, now you're talking about hours of time that Hostomel Airport, everybody in the city, in the country knows, we better get to Hostomel really quick. You have to stop what you know is going on. Uh, a lot of that's based on Ukrainian and Kyiv's ability to see things with drones, cameras, uh, intelligence, uh, civilians from the 40th Rapid Reaction Brigade, which happens to be stationed at at Hostomel, which happened to have just a few, in relative terms to the brigade, forces there to start engaging the Russians. And that starts immediately. And then that night is a counterattack of fourth rapid reaction because special forces air assault. And we talked to some of those people. And, and what happens when you leave 200 of the best soldiers in the world by themselves for a long time against a massive counterattack, which includes artillery, is that you get a lot of dead paratroopers. Don't care how, be how best they are. If all they're carrying is ATGMs on their back, they're not gonna do very well for very long. Um, so the counterattack happens on, on the, at that night on February 24th. Uh, Hostomel is back in Ukrainian hands on the next day. But in, 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 you, in the credit of Russia, is that while course of action number two, Joint Forcible Entry has happened, those mounted formations are on their way. They're hours away from Hostomel, coming down out of Belarus. Um, even though that there are elements engaging that convoy all the way up by Ivankiv, they're on the way. So the Ukrainians make a decision on February 25th, which I found fascinating, and I couldn't learn until I actually came here, is why did Hostomel fail? I and mean, even with challenge and everything, the Ukrainians crater the airfield. One of the ways they use is this 2S7 artillery piece, which is over 200 millimeters, very large gun. 
and they crater, which I'm from this world, and there's a couple ways you can park construction equipment on the airfield, you can, you can drag trenches at, like the ISIS did in Mosul to keep aircraft from landing. The Ukrainians make a decision to pull off of Hostomel, crater the airfield, no more joint forcible entry coming in through Hostomel. Um, and, and that's the first critical moment because when I try to tell a story about a battle, you have to talk about the critical moments. There's things going on across all over the city. Everybody's standing up. There's a lot going on, but there are critical moments which the, the path and the branch and the sequel of that battle takes a turn. This took a turn for Russia. Um, because they lost those forces, and the Ukrainians who were at that counterattack said it was like shooting fish in a barrel, like an arcade game, because they just sat on the exterior and shot Russians who had no cover and concealment, rained down artillery that had been hidden the night before, and it's, it's a really bad day if you're in a paratrooper. So that's day two, right? And I got these cool graphics from, from friends that do maps, that, like I, I, I've had in the audience. So the joint forcible entry gone. Mounted attack happening. It's matter of fact, the, the, the real difference between the dead VDV and the arrival of the mounted formations is only a, hours. So that was the issue. Had those mounted formations made it to Hostomel and linked up with the VDV, there was still a chance of doing that operation or at least pushing that mounted formation through the Hostomel, through her pin into Butcha and achieve the, you know, achieve the goal or not through Bucha, but through her pen and achieve the goal. Well, here's the problem, though, is that mounted formations must stay on the roads. This is the muddy season. Uh, and then the other aspect is, again, I said cities are people, buildings, and infrastructure. At a very high level, a decision was made, and this, nobody will tell me who made the decision because they don't want to get in trouble for the number of bridges that were dropped. Around 300 bridges were blown up. All the bridges. Well, not all of them. The bridges that they wanted to blow, Ukrainians, as in Ukraine, blew the bridges. Bridges are really important to militaries. As a matter of fact, not all bridges, but some bridges, because some bridges can hold tanks and heavy armor, and some bridges can't. But they went and blew a lot of bridges. And talking about night, day, day one, day two, I don't know how they did it. I don't want to know. As a matter of fact, nobody wants to tell me who did it. Uh, the bridges all got blown up. Uh, that made the course of action number three, which is the only course of action left, going to be very hard to move into a city, but even to the peri-urban of a city like Kiev, which is really irrigated by these rivers and, and estuaries and, and trenches that all support the agriculture that supported this ancient city. And you just start blowing bridges, and then the, the 3,000 routes to achieve your goal are now down to like three. So here's the other fascinating part. Again, these are moments that lead to success or failure for both sides. There are still many routes into Kyiv mounted, even if they're hardball road. It's a very large city. So one of the things the Ukraine did was weaponize the infrastructure. They decided to blow the dam at Irpin. I've met a few people who were the guy who did it. Uh, I just know it was done. I don't need to know who did it. I'm not going to put his name down. Uh, or who, who, who brought the ideal, it's actually been like in New York Times, who brought the ideal to, it doesn't matter, it was blown, uh, it, it rose the level of the water in the Irpin, it flooded Dmitev, which we know about, which is really taking away this, this really straight path coming you know, north to south down into the city center. It took that away, but it also raised the water all across the Irpin, but oh, by the way, there are actually other rivers that I was told that were not blown, but opened on purpose to raise the water level, to make it more of a challenge to move into the city, even to get into the city. It has happened in war before. I found it fascinating that, that this is one of the reasons I say, and I'll say this now for you guys before even the ending, is that you could have dropped American, NATO, any force you wanted to, a large force in the Kyiv, and they could not have done what Ukraine did to defend the city. It's just not possible. The level of detail, the level of this is our city, to know that if you blow that dam at that place, you're going to cause massive problems. Nobody in the world could have done that other than the Ukrainians.
and I, I did 25 years in the US military, I'm very proud of my service, nobody could have defended this city with that like the Ukrainians did. But that's fascinating, so they weaponized not just one river, but multiple rivers, raised the rivers, so now you have rivers that are blown, or bridges that are blown with river levels that are raised, you just cause massive problems for a military who needs one goal, get where they need to go. That's all they need, they don't need to kill anybody, they just need to get somewhere. So the other thing that they did, as in Ukraine, and uh, it, um, I just talk in those generalities, is weaponize the population. Now, even if you think there's only a million people left in Kyiv, if you can weaponize one-tenth of those, you just turned your 3,000-person military, your 12,000, if you had that many, TDF, or your, your civilian volunteer fighters, to 120,000. So what they did was hand out massive amounts of AK-47s. Uh, some of those were in semi-trucks, and they literally pulled the semi-truck, and this is in a pen, um, where there was no military initially in the first couple of days, and just started handing out AK-47s. You got one AK-47 and two magazines. If you're a military guy, that won't last long, but if there's 10,000 of those, they can really cause a problem, especially if they have to cover an area, but the only thing left are like three streets. Well, if I was a military guy, I, I, that, I could do a lot with that. Uh, there, there is no real record of the number of weapons because the police also handed out weapons and the military handed out weapons and people had weapons. And as soon as the Russians start dying at Hashemel, there's, okay, now there's really fancy Russian weapons I can use. Uh, that's what's happening in, in the first days. So this is a small bit of, that I played. Um, um, and, and it's not the example of what I did. It's just an example of that. Of course, he, it was impossible to cut from information to cut from the world. So this is the first time in a real major large-scale combat operation where the city and the defenders are being influenced from the outside world, both in coverage and in with information. So on February 26th, I hear about Kiev putting out over radio signals, go out and resist um, because they're trying to mobilize a civilization. Make Molotov cocktails, they start making hedgehogs, um, I have issues with the hedgehogs, but that's a separate conversation. So I thought I could do a little better. So I've been studying urban war for a little while. I've been in a couple urban fights, but more importantly, I've studied in history of major battles from the Battle of Berlin, Seoul, Manila, what the defenders do that cause militaries a lot of problems. So I started tweeting out things that I would do. John Spencer, civilian, not associated with any part of the US government, uh, just as a civilian, what I would do well, those tweets were seen by 20 million people. I can't say that was 20 million Ukrainians. Those tweets became little picture diagrams. That, that became a book um, called The Mini Mania for the Urban Defender, which I know was, a, was in Kyiv. Um, again, I won't say that I had influence over it, but it was, it's really important because there is an ancient European model of what's called total defense, as in every country thinks that if they get invaded, everybody's going to rise up, and they're gonna fight the, the attacker. That has happened in history, but it doesn't actually happen often. Um, but this wasn't something that got written about a lot after World War II called total resistance, which is when you've actually been invaded and you want everybody to be you know, guerrillas and, and, and attack the military once they're in. This is total defense. The civilians were weaponized to defend the terrain, to defend the capital city. Uh, and I had the ability as as a, you know, just as a nobody, um, and these are versions of the manual that, that later came, and now it's a version five, and it's been translated into 14 different languages because evidently there's lots of places in the world who want to be able to use their civilians if called upon to defend their ground against a larger aggressor. Yes. Uh, so what, what happened was that Ukraine did go out and start causing trouble. Uh, they started parking now, this, it's a double-edged sword because other people I talked to, yeah, that was a real pain in the butt. We, could, we couldn't go anywhere. They started blocking all the streets. They started setting up checkpoints. They started um, doing anything they could, which is actually a mental thing in war. It's give people things to do. It actually helps in their mental state. So they started preparing for if the Russians ever got to the center of the city. So lots going on. So another critical moment, February 27th, a Russian formation actually gets in, into the periphery of Kyiv, in Bucha, although awful things happen in Bucha, but on February 27th, 
this photo, which is my opening photo, actually becomes iconic because of its surprise, but also the complexity of it. So this is, if you know, this is in Bucha. This is a uh, Station Street. On the far side is a, 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 a mall called the Giraffe Mall. What's critical is the military guy is, what's at the front of that formation is not just a baited ambush, but one of the few bridges left open. So the VDV and the forces that do it, occupy Hostomel start putting up Orland UAVs all over the place, and they're everywhere doing really good intelligence of where they need to go and what they need to do. Whether this convoy knew what it was doing or not, it was headed towards one of the few crossing points left over the rivers, one of the rivers of this area. But unfortunately, this terrain is a, why urban warfare is so hard, is that you can't spread out. Um, even if you're using, although it wasn't really using good tactics, and we could talk about that. The point is they ran into a very, like a squad level size formation on the other side of that bridge with a baited vehicle sitting in front of it that they engaged the first vehicle with. But the problem is that there are other people in Bucha which are now weaponized. And this, I call, I'm sorry, I don't know his name. Um, I call him the fighting grandpa who had fought in the past. Um, and this is one of the things I think that the movie Red Dawn, if you've ever seen it, gets wrong is that you need veterans. And this is what you saw a lot of self organizing civilians were veterans of whether it's 2014, if not well before that, military service and in the communities. He had gotten an RPG 18 from a friend who happened to get it from Hostamel. And he engages one of the fuel trucks in this convoy. And if you can imagine, if you've ever been in a, in a, in a, in a traffic jam or something, and something happens at the front of it, and now there's things blowing up in the middle of it. I, if I was the military community, I could talk about how the Russians had reorganized themselves. They didn't have enough dismounts. Many of these vehicles had a driver and a passenger, um, all of that information. But this was a classic ambush. Once the, Grandpa helps initiate this ambush, it's just all hell breaks loose. Because then the 72nd Mechanized Brigade Artillery can dial in and, and destroy a massive amount of Russian vehicles. Rumored to be 100 vehicles that are destroyed on that street. On February 27th, if you think about that, that's a critical moment. One, to show everybody that it is possible to fight the Russians because that aspect of, of causing everybody to cower against your, your capability is very big. But two, to show that it, it, it's the hot gates of Thermopylae. Why did the hot gates of Thermopylae work? It's because if you can constrain a military to a very narrow pass, you're not fighting a thousand Russians. You're fighting one Russian at a time. And, and in this convoy, you really get to see it. So what happens is, is, is by day five, you're actually fighting a counter-mobility mobility fight. The Russians, again, just need to get to the, to the middle. And they're really trying. They're trying really hard. They're starting to progress around. And, and down here in Markov, you see them start to split these formations, again, being held at Cherniv. And you've got to give Cherniv credit in the first guard for defending Cherniv so strongly, because had it not, even into day five, and then you see the formations moving into the, you know, in Bravari and other areas, they're still advancing. They still have a chance to achieve their objective. All right, so this is uh, it, radio interception. I'm not gonna say how that was done. Um, by day five, we know that the Russians are broadcasting and in, in being intercepted that I'm out of ammo, I'm out of fuel. I'm out of food, I need help. Uh, because they're starting to be confused. And I'm not even talking about the, the things that the Ukraine also did, which ripped down all of the traffic signs. Ukrainians made it really hard to get places. Russians, some didn't know where they were going. Some had old maps. Some, it's it just the chaos of war. We know at this point are some really good open source um, intelligence showing that the Russians are really struggling at this point uh, to include the infamous 40, 40, 40 mile, at one, at some people report, or 40 kilometer convoy coming all the way down out of Belarus through Ivankiv um, and trying to get to the formations uh, in Hostomel, in Arpin, trying to bring in everything that a advanced force like that needs and it's the same way the West would do it. Mounted penetration moving with speed and shock and awe, 
followed by logistical trains that will then resupply once they've made first contact. Well, again, there's very few roads and everybody in the world sees this convoy coming to include Ukraine who sends things out to make it go boom, um, it, but it can't advance. It was never stuck. The 40 kilometer convoy was never stuck. It just couldn't advance forward because it, it sure did turn around later. So it, there's a thing within my community about urban defenders usually lose. So it's really hard to defend for a certain amount you know, and win. It, it is viewed in military theory as the strongest form of warfare, but the weakest political action you can take. You're usually defending so you can, you can go on the attack, but militaries have to be able to do both. But Kyiv didn't have to defend forever. Although I do argue geopolitically, Ukraine had to defend itself first, um, but it didn't have to defend forever. And in a city attack like this, since I study city attacks, you don't have to defend forever. You have to defend it for a certain amount of time. At this point, Kyiv is a, a, a castle, and all you have to do is close the castle gates. It's a moat city. You just turned it into a moat city, close the castle gates. Your defender is going to have a lot of problems supplying itself that can't get into the city. And that's what you see. And just like in ancient warfare, what starts happening on day seven is a counterattack, which is really entertaining to General Zaluzny posts on Facebook that they just liberated, and I'm sorry if I mess up the name of the town, Markov, 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 yes, uh, I would mess up the same, but he posts on Facebook that we just liberated the city. So the 95th Airborne, very close to Kyiv, is already counterattacking the Russians in Kyiv. This is when your plan starts to fall apart and you give your other side time, things will start to happen. And this is, you know, there's literally tens of thousands of people in Kyiv doing things, um, starting to fly drones, set up reconnaissance, starting to attack any Russian formation, holding their pin. There's so much going on. But by day seven, reinforcements are already starting to show up. So this is for military communities um, about the, what we call a three block war. You can ask the military force to both have to engage the enemy in attack, uh, protect help preserve civilians, be a part of evacuation and humanitarian aid. And that's what people get to see in the Battle of Kyiv. That's what the military was doing. These are military formations that are trying to establish safe zones for uh, civilians, trying to get them across bridges. And, th and there's the famous one in their pen, but it was happening in many locations. That's the three block war that is urban combat since it will have non-combatants in it. And if it's your non-combatants, you're really gonna protect them. So it's interesting, I've learned a lot about this aspect of, of, of um, since I've been here this time. I give this highlight to, uh, and I call it gr the fighting grandma, because out here on the hinterlands of Bravari, as you can see by day 10, the formations are, are closing in on the east side of Kiev, and the east side of Kiev topographically is a lot different than the west side of Kiev. The density is different. The main avenues of approach, the lines of sight, the the uh, elevations are all different. But on the east side, out here, and they took me all the way out there, and I didn't know where I was going. It was out in the farmland, like, look, I'm the urban guy. But my host wanted me to see grandma's house and the active minefield that is actually just the blown up debris, because grandma, on day 10 of the war, looks out her house and sees this large convoy outside of her house of Russians that includes fuel trucks, ammo trucks, uh, other vehicles. And because you, Kiev set up a system, a very effective system and intelligence fusion, which I, again, why nobody else could do this, that had been in the works before, um, if you know about it, then, then you know about it, made it possible that grandma could pull out her phone and call somebody or use an app and then report this Russian formation that then gets filtered through and which it blows my mind as a, a former military guy sitting in Baghdad in, in fusion cells, that a civilian would call in, that there's a convoy, and then you validate that through different assets and direct a TBT drone towards the convoy and blow it to smithereens. And they say that God protected grandma on that day because it blew everything in that entire region up except grandma's house. It's just that that is war. But that is an aspect to sensor management that is war. You're not gonna enter an urban area and not be seen. And we saw that during this war, whether it was a traffic camera 
or other types of cameras, whether it's a drone, whether it's a civilian with a cell phone, if you, even if you tried to shut down the cell phone network, there's sensors, it's impossible to hide, but how Kiev in, in Ukraine was able to filter those in blows my mind, and I've learned a lot about it, and, and it is, um, again, why a very unique situation, this, this, this battle needs to be recorded in history. So on day 15, there's a little battle going on in, in, in a city called Mashoon, or a village. I was taken to this, the, this, the village, and I almost, like, look, dude, I'm the urban guy, and we're driving through, like, the Herkin Forest to get out here to Mashoon because it's surrounded by these dense woods. Um, I had studied a little bit. I knew a little bit what it was and why I wanted to go there. But because, again, because you got to give Russians credit where they had credit, they're in chaos. It's, it's two weeks into the war. They can't get where they're going. They identified that at Mashoon, they could ford the Erpin River. And if they can get through Mashoon, they'd have a clear path to the city center. So they do it. They actually, and in bridging, and it, with few assets, everybody in the world has learned you need a lot more bridging assets. You got to be do what's called a wet gap crossing. You got to be able to do that. The Russians successfully bridged the Erpin at Mashoon um, because, again, uh, Ukraine had developed a system to know what the Russians were doing even before other Russians knew what Russians were doing. They said, hey, you might, I will go, I'm going to send people to Machine. And there are a lot of people that got sent there. Initially, it's a very small force uh, that made up of a lot of different organizations that are really struggling to hold the Russians at Mashoon. But if you can buy time like they did and you send other forces, and then there's a reason that artillery is king of the battle and still remains king of the battle on the modern battlefield. What happens in Mashoon is that eventually the Ukrainians are able to use both the urban, because there's one road that leads from that bridge uh, river crossing through Mashoon and get you out of Mashoon. And there's one road, which makes it really hard as a, as a military guy to push stuff through there. If you have fighting positions in the dense wood that can protect them from your artillery, and oh, here comes the Ukrainian artillery. And ultimately, that Ukrainian artillery assist in this point, which you could call the gates, the you know, the Battle of Thermopylae for uh, for Kiev, because had Machine fall again, key moments, had Machine not held, had those brave defenders not held there, the battle might have gone a very different direction. So there's the the river crossing that gets blown up. We know that later in Severodon, yes, they lose like Russians lose like two battalions trying to cross the river. Um, this is, if you, I, I feel bad being in Ukraine and showing this picture, but this is the, the road that leads adjacent to Mashoon, but the damage is very clear. I took this photo just like showing the density of the wooded terrain because urban is a combination of man-made features in conjunction with uh, natural features. So 21 days in, into, the, into the battle, uh, lots going on, of course, all over the city. You have uh, a TDF force that was turned from 12,000 to 120,000. Nobody knows the, tr the true number, a giant number. Um, you have a new organizations forming, new command and control structures, fusion centers and subordinate fusion centers integrating anything and everything on every Russian that could even come near or smell the area of Kiev. They're being watched. But over here in Brovary again, I personally think that the Russians are know they're in chaos, know they have, are losing the chance, the one chance they'll ever have at the city of Kiev. And they get ordered to move, as in they, they the Russian formations uh, on the east side in the hinterland to which there's still truck, uh, tank, Russian tanks stuck in the mud in Bavari that they took me to because they can't even get them out with tractors. Uh, they run into a lot of problems, but I think they around this time they get the orders from higher, like all soldiers do, like, I don't care. Move. Attack. Uh, and this is what leads to the anti-armor ambush in Ski Burn, I call it Sky Burn, uh, which is a really famous video online. As if you're a military guy, like, what are they doing? Why are they in parade formation? You know, not, not even with a reconnaissance or a bounding overwatch or nothing. They're just driving down the road. I don't have the, all the answers to that. I do think that they were ordered to move quickly, um, but what they run into is a, a very well-prepared 
72nd Mechanized Brigade checkpoint blocking position ambush, what you call it what you want. And they knew that this formation was coming a long time before it started moving, not just when it showed up on the road, because you can see down the E95 for a very long way. And the, the bridge is, again, another bridge left open was, but it was left open with like initially a platoon of the 72nd Mechanized Brigade. And as I go around the world, this is what I, because we have a real resistance to civilians anywhere near us. I, I don't like civilians near me. Like, go away, I, go away. That, that's what you usually do is you pass them off. So what do you do if you're the 72nd Mechanized Brigade who has 100 volunteers showing up per day going, how can I help? Um, well, when you take, take that position, 10 to 2, and that's the element of the complexity of an urban fight. That's what they were doing, is that these positions, like the 72nd Mechanized Brigade, to the top right is a, is a TV journalist that you know, made the news, as a TV journalist who had, for some reason, had trained on the Stugna before the war, who did, once the war happened on February 21st, made some calls, went and picked up a Stugna, called her friend in the 72nd Mechanized Brigade, and he said, oh yeah, go, to, go here. Go to this checkpoint. And she was a part of this with other people, this you know, very iconic anti-armor ambush that happens in Skyburn. So uh, by day 36, if you can see from these graphics, which are really good, Cherniv holds. I mean, I think that that story should be written very strongly. Um, Eastern Kiev holds very strongly. Uh, but there's also a lot more blue icons in the middle of Kyiv. There are fundamental principles for attacking a capital city. There are multiple courses of action and ways you can do it. I could, I could list out six. Uh, one of the ones in this one is you never cut, you never isolate the city. And you don't have to surround the city to isolate it. But the southern advances of, of this capital city were never cut off. There are people ordering massive cameras and installing them as the war is going on because I'm not saying Amazon delivered those, but stuff's still coming into the city. And weapons are coming into the city. In-laws are coming into the city. Special forces and reinforcements are coming into the city. It's going to be really hard for your small little Russian forces to do what they're doing if, if the person they're opposing is advancing and the 140-kilometer convoy can't get off the road. And that's what happens. So... On April 1st, we know, the world saw, Russia, the second most powerful military on paper, publicly announced defeat, publicly ordered a withdrawal, publicly stated their strategic objectives. Oh, that, that wasn't our goal. Our goal is the Donbass. But this is a time when you can see, I teach war for a living, and it's really hard to say what victory looks like. But it isn't hard to say what a decisive battle looks like, as in something that actually determines strategic objectives. Because Kyiv held and defended itself, Russia lost the war for Ukraine. It'll never get another shot at taking the nation of Ukraine because of this one urban battle. So it, it will take its place greater than many of the urban battles that I write, write about. Uh, so what's interesting is that they make this call. They say, hey, no, no, that wasn't our goal. Dunbas, the South. Uh, that's April 1st. That's April 2nd. Uh, if you got to give the Russians credit for one thing, although they did a lot of things right, they had a, they had a very robust plan with multiple courses of action. There's one thing that they did, and I went all the way up to Ivankiv, I went all the way up to Chernobyl to where my, my driver was very um, not happy how far north we were going to look at how the Russians withdrew themselves with actually not sustaining many casualties. The, some Ukrainians I talked to said they thought that another attack was coming because artillery rounds started increasing on April 1st. Well, one thing that the Russians are very trained at, clearly they're not trained at conducting force projection to take a capital city against opposing formations where the population is also against you. But one thing that they actually did train back in Russia was withdrawals. And that's a military term. There's only three, you know, attack, defend, withdrawal. And there are, there are variations of withdrawal and there are variations of attacking and defending. They withdrew, and that should go into history books tech by textbook. They secured critical bridges in Ivankiv and along the route. They dug tank ditches into the cement 
and had tank companies securing the withdrawal route. They increased artillery, which I don't know why they didn't use that before, increased artillery to cover withdrawing forces. And overnight, that stuck 40 kilometer convoy turned around and drove away. And it wasn't there no more. And they actually didn't lose that many forces, just like in Harrison. Um, I learned actually through further interviews of American generals that, no, no, that's something they practice in large scale operations back in Russia was withdrawals. You can, I'm not saying nobody, we all should practice withdrawals, but that was pretty impressive. So what are the lessons that I tell people they should take from, you know, it, it varies by stakeholder, right? If I'm talking to a tank uh, regiment, I have different lessons. If I'm talking to paratroopers like last week, I have different lessons. But in general is that you have to understand the city. And this is why, again, nobody understood the city to include Russians better than the residents of Kyiv. And whether you understand that they had a plan to defend the city, whether that wasn't executed, whether it was delayed started, um, whether all the different variables, the reorganization of the police, the reorganization of the government, reorganization of the military and the TDF, all those things, um, you have to understand the actual physical terrain to include the underground. You have to understand the people um, and, and the influence that they'll have on your operation as a military because within the military community, we like to practice urban warfare with no, no civilians around. You just fight it out against an enemy, defending urban terrain. Like there are millions uh, of civilians that can either be against you, which was the case in here in Kyiv. They can be for you, which wasn't the case here in Kyiv. Or they can be neutral and just hiding. And that's usually what we like to practice if they're hiding and they're in their basements and we, and we need to deal with them as an obstacle. All militaries must be able to defend, and, and this is a big, actually a weakness in Western militaries is that we're always attacking. It doesn't matter from where, around the world, but we're attacking. We'll, nobody needs to defend, like Patton, like attack. In uh, the war in Ukraine definitely shows that everybody is attacking or defending at any point, but you better be able to, to hold ground that you want to keep just as much as you are taking ground that you want to take and again, where the Russians have shown wanting is on their ability to defend. Uh, resource civilian additions, you know, th there will be a lot more learned about the double-edged sword of giving people not trained in weapons, lots of weapons. Um, and there were issues, how do you get those weapons back? Um, but the ideal of total defense was shown in this, this case study to be very effective. And it wasn't even really, I mean, it was tested in places like Erpin, Bucha, but you know, deep into the city, if you think about a large complex when there's thousands of weapons, you don't know where that is. And that's what I put in my manual. It, it, I, as a military guy, that, that's very scary. Uh, if you don't know where, what's fighting at you. In the, again, Red Dawn didn't have any veterans in it. Um, you have to have this flexibility in, in the um, apparatus in which to have the awareness when you have limited resources. Why does Hostomel, Moshun, um, Markov, Bravari all go, because of that intelligence picture, because of that fusion of information. I mean, it just, I'm telling you in the West, it blows your mind that a civilian would call in and go, hey, there's some guys here, you might want to take care of it. There's no mechanism really for that, at that scale especially. And how that was done, I know it's being shared, but it needs to be shared at great load because the cognitive load of the military is in that's what we say in the urban terrain the complexity is unlike any other environment look it's hard to fight in the jungles been there it's hard to fight at high altitude like in pakistan your weapons don't fire but the complexity of the fighting in urban terrain is unlike any other place on the planet and we see that in the battle of kiev and how you reduce the cognitive load for the fighters for the commanders who are making decisions is a very uh, tough thing uh, I have I have lessons about the actual fact that urban terrain is, is unavoidable. I wrote something recently about what I've taken. Of course, there's, it's mostly urban uh, from the last year of war in Ukraine. Um, it's a fact that your the objectives will be urban, and we see that as fighting today. You're going to have to go through urban, but the decisive moments of any war are going to be in the cities or for the cities. There's some human nature to that. As people just like the na naming something, like name to me a battle, if you're not in the military, that isn't a city. 
it, it just, it's just a, there's a human aspect to, and why that's an enduring nature. Um, that's my last slide. Those are some of my books. This one is the Manny Manual for the Urban Defender that I actually updated after visiting last time as everything from how do you shoot low moving things down with small arms. All these are lessons relearned and all I did was take from many manuals and put it into one with little diagrams because people under stress need simple instructions. But I updated it after my last visit. I might update it, but there's a version five online, a free to the world uh, for now. Well, with that, I'd like to turn it over to questions. Um, again, it's about storytelling and, and, and capturing the moments. There's so many other things that could be written about the Battle of Kiev. I mean, how it was done, but we have to tell this story. I mean, why I keep coming back is, is to gather more and more of the story um, to understand how the second most powerful military on paper was defeated uh, at the most decisive battle of the modern era.